Luke 24, verses 13 through 35. It's interesting as we go to the text. Uh, this is one of the, the longest stories in Luke's gospel. Uh, there's a man here named Cleopas, and we don't know much about this person. The early church historian Eusebius suggested, and this is not in your text, but Eusebius, a few hundred years later, said this might have been, based on some historical records, it could have been Joseph's brother, which would make him Jesus Christ's uncle. So that's just speculation, but it's an interesting thought from Eusebius. It may or may not be true. What's interesting in the text here, there's an irony that just frames the entire text. Here you have these two disciples that are going to be walking, talking about a dead Jesus Christ, when in fact they're in the presence of a living Jesus Christ who is talking to lifeless disciples. So there's a, there's a subtle irony throughout the text here. And it says here at the end that their eyes are opened. That's what Luke describes it. Their eyes are open to this, which is used, that word is used six times in Luke's gospel. Opening, and it's always to divine revelation, that you see something. And so here is an example of that, that their eyes are opened because before they had doubts and now they have hope. And their eyes are open to see the risen Christ in their presence. So uh, let's look at these verses, verses 13 through 35. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem, and they were talking with each other about all these things that had happened. And while they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. And he said to them, what is this conversation that you're holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, well, what things? And they said to him, well, concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a prophet mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. We had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all, that is, in the third day third day since these things have happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back, saying that they had even seen a vision of angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken, was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. And so they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going further, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. And when he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were open, and they recognized him, and he vanished from their sight. And they said to each other, did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures? And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem, and they found the eleven, and those who were with them gathered together, saying, The Lord has risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you this morning for your word, and we thank you for uh, this story from Luke chapter 24, and we pray that your Holy Spirit would minister to us now uh, through your word. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. Well, I want to I list about five or six names here. These are well-known names uh, from the last couple hundred years, I guess, and I want you to think about what these different individuals, what they have in common. I want you to think about what they have in common. Okay, so a few names here. The first, the inventor Nikola Tesla, Charles Dickens, Charles Darwin, the philosopher Soren Kierkegaard, philosopher Frederick Nietzsche, and Ernest Hemingway. So we've got maybe six names or so there. What do you think those individuals have in common? I want you to just think for a second. They're all famous. I think you should know all those names. Uh, they've all contributed in some way, some might say in positive ways, others maybe in some negative ways, depending on um, how you read that, to the philosophical foundations or intellectual foundations or the literary foundations of the West in the 21st century. So they have that in common. Anything else you know about these individuals that they have in common? 
One thing I read recently that these individuals have in common is every person I mentioned, Tesla, Dickens, Darwin, Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Hemingway, they all like to go on long walks and think. Think about things. Reflect on things. They all went intentionally. wasn't out of boredom. They all intentionally went on walks. And so writers like Dickens and Hemingway and Nietzsche would take daily walks to simulate their thoughts on philosophy or literature or on a story. Nikola Tesla took walks, and it was actually on one of his walks in Budapest that he, as I read this week, he began to have the idea of this rotating magnetic field. One of his inventions was on a walk in Budapest. A famous historian from the first century, a contemporary, really, of the Lord Jesus Christ was a man named Seneca. Seneca wrote, he said, we should take wandering outdoor walks so that the mind might be nourished and refreshed by the open air and by deep breathing. So here's, here's my thought here. Going for walks was important for some of these important people. It helped them think about things and process things, helped them become creative. And we know today, and you can look, look at this on your own time, that there's lots of different studies that show the, just the benefits of going for a long walk, everything from increased um, blood to your brain from just walking. Uh, there are studies that show the benefits for people struggling with Alzheimer's. Just going for walks can help. With that, so we we know even now through science and through medicine, there's other advantages besides just what they what these writers and authors and philosophers found. But long walks can be life changing. It was for people like Hemingway, for Tesla, for people like Seneca in the first century. The story we have this morning is a story of a life changing walk for these two individuals. It's not just a walk down Pitt Street. In the old, it's a walk that changed their lives forever. We've, we've been studying Luke for about two years, and you notice, and this is the final example of it, as we've studied Luke's gospel, Luke likes to use stories with two people, couples, two men or a man and a woman, a rich person, a poor person. He likes to use these, and this is one of the final examples where he's using two people in the story, and they're going on a life-changing walk. It's one of the longest stories in Luke's gospel. And they're on this walk, and they're, going to meet the crucified and risen Son of God. And it's life-changing for that reason alone, but also because as they begin the walk, they're in some sort of confusion, grief, doubts. And by the time that the walk is over and the day is over, there's hope, there is celebration in their life because they realize what has just happened. And so this morning, this is a life-changing walk for these individuals. And so we're going to look at the story, and there's several things I want you to see after we look at the story, several things that we want to see and be able to apply from God's Word this morning. So as we look at the story, a couple people walking from Jerusalem to Emmaus, probably, be, probably because Passover celebration is over, and so now they're going home, and it says they're going to Emmaus. Not really certain where that is. There's some speculation that it might have been west of Jerusalem, so maybe they're walking west of Jerusalem. And as they're walking... They're discussing the death of Jesus Christ and reports of an empty tomb. And there's some confusion. They're not really sure what's happened. And the risen Christ comes alongside them during their walk, and they don't recognize him. Which There's a lot of potential rabbit trails in this story. We're going to try to stay on track here. We're not really sure why they don't recognize him. But it's very similar to, say, Matthew 28 and John 20, where other people are in the presence of the risen Christ and don't recognize him immediately. And we're not really sure why. It could be maybe his resurrected body is unique in some way. Perhaps they're walking west. Some have commented they're walking west and staring in the sun, and they're not really looking to the right or the left to see who the person is. Perhaps they're just overwhelmed with grief and not really paying attention, and there's just a lot of fog in the brain. Or perhaps it's something where God has kept the identity of Christ from them, and there's something supernatural. We don't know. We, we don't know, but they don't recognize him here. And so Christ asks them what they're talking about, not because he's ignorant, but because he wants to draw out from them what they're talking about and how they're feeling, what's going on in their lives. So he asks them, and he acts almost ignorant. In verse 18, they give their response, these two pilgrims as they are. And the way the sentence is structured is it begins with the word you. So their response to Christ is, you must be the only guy in town who doesn't know this. You must be the only guy who's ignorant. And so there's a, a, a subtle irony here. These two individuals act as if Christ is ignorant of something and that they're in the know about all the things that's happened in Jerusalem, whereas Christ is really the only one in the know. And these two people are ignorant not only of the resurrection, but also ignorant of the person next to them. So there's a little subtle irony here that Luke gives us 
in the story. Jesus is the only one who knows what's going on at this point. And so these two individuals say, well, we'll fill you in since you're, you don't keep up with the news. Uh, here's what's happened over the last 48 hours, the last 72 hours. Jesus Christ was a prophet, mighty in word and deed. Uh, that's a phrase used in Acts 7 to describe Moses. So Jesus was a top-level guy for them. They looked up to him. He was a prophet like Moses. He was great. But he's dead. And, and, and now we've heard that the tomb is empty and they've reported some angels, but no one's actually seen Jesus, so we're not really sure what's going on. So they report all that to Jesus, letting him know what's happened, because he doesn't know, apparently. And then Jesus responds, and it's interesting here, because Jesus is going to give them a, a subtle rebuke. It's kind of soft, and it's interesting because he doesn't get upset or rebuke them for not believing the testimony of these women, He doesn't get upset with them for not believing the evidence of the empty tomb. He doesn't get upset with them because they don't recognize him. Notice what Jesus rebukes them for or corrects them for. It's none of those things, which is what I would mean. Slap in the face. The tomb's empty. What are you doing? You believe these people? Jesus rebukes them for not believing the word of God. They did not believe the writings of the Hebrew Bible, the Old Testament. And Jesus says, you didn't believe the Bible? You didn't believe what you knew? from the scrolls of Isaiah in the Old Testament? You didn't read any of that? Jesus is essentially saying, if you read the Old Testament and Jesus says, if you believe that he was a prophet, how did they treat the prophets in the Old Testament? They weren't celebrities. King Ahab did not give Elijah preferred parking at the palace. They tried to kill him, right? Elijah wasn't that popular. If you read about Jeremiah, not popular, right? Amos, we, uh, Gary was teaching on Amos probably a couple months ago. They didn't ask Amos, hey, can we add like a Sunday night service and do more of your speaking, Amos? No, they said, go home. We're tired of your message, Amos. The prophets of the Old Testament were not celebrated widely by the leadership in Jerusalem and Israel. They were rejected. And Christ is saying, didn't you think that that was going to happen to Christ? If he's a prophet, and he is, he comes from God as the word of God, he would be rejected like Jeremiah and like Amos and like Elijah. Weren't you expecting that? And weren't you expecting that after his rejection and his suffering and his death, there would be a resurrection? Why didn't you believe that? So that's where the subtle rebuke comes in, is not believing God's word. And then that leads us to verse 27, which is one of the most inviting sentences in all of Scripture. It's one of the most interesting sentences because it it should pique your curiosity as to what actually happened. Verse 27, it says, Christ Quote, and beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he, Jesus Christ, interpreted them in all the scriptures, the things concerning himself. Beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted them in the script, all the scriptures. Jesus Christ gives a seminary class on himself. It's a Christology course led by Christ as they walk down this road in a life-changing walk. And it's inviting because you, you'd think, okay, as we read this, what passages... Did Christ refer to? How did Christ teach them? Where did Christ go to? What, what was he thinking of? How did he instruct them? What passages from the Hebrew Bible did Christ use? Did he go to Genesis 22, for example, where Abraham is told to sacrifice his beloved son? And did Christ say, didn't you know that a beloved son would have to die and be sacrificed? It wasn't Isaac. It was going to be me. Maybe Christ went to Exodus chapter 12. The Israelites are in Egypt. They're they're slaves to the Egyptians. And then there's that first Passover, Exodus chapter 12. And they have to put blood on the the wooden door frame so that their firstborn son is not killed. Maybe Christ pointed them to that and said, there's not going to be blood on a door frame. There's blood on a wooden cross because the son did die. I fulfilled that. Maybe Christ said, hey, did you read that interesting book called Job? It's a long book. It's It's a puzzling book, but Job is about an innocent man who suffers greatly. Didn't you realize that the Messiah would be innocent and suffer greatly. He would be the, really, the, the realization of Job. Didn't you read, we talked about this, I think, a few weeks ago. Didn't you read about the judges before the monarchy? There was judges that God used to lead Israel. Didn't you read about that last judge, the one who was in the world's strongest man competition named Samson? And how Samson's life ended with death, but it was a death that was leading to a victory for God's people. I mentioned that a few weeks ago. That Christ in his death would lead to a victory for his people, just like Samson did. Did you read about that? Did you read the Psalms? Maybe Psalm 22, where it's a, a royal psalm of King David, where he says, God, why have you forsaken me? And didn't you realize that Psalm 22 would point to the true son of David, the true king, 
which is Christ, and that he would be forsaken on the cross because of our sins. Didn't you read that? Didn't you read about how Elijah and Elisha, they raised two boys from death to life? 1 Kings 17 talks about a widow's son that Elijah raises to life. 2 Kings chapter 4, the Shunammite woman, and and Elisha raises her son to life. Christ might have said, didn't that show you that there was going to be a resurrection? And who else would do it but the Son of God? I think it's very possible and probably likely that he spent some time on Isaiah 53 and said, didn't you read Isaiah 53, the suffering servant who would be wounded for our transgression, crushed for our iniquities, oppressed, afflicted like a lamb led to a slaughter? Didn't you realize that's not a corporate Israel? That is a person who would fulfill that, and that's me. Maybe he went to Zechariah 12 and 13 where Zechariah, who is a post-exilic prophet, And in chapter 12, they mourn. We talked about this, I think, two weeks ago, maybe three weeks ago in in Luke chapter 23. They mourn over, they weep over the loss of one who has been killed. And then in Zechariah 13, there's a shepherd who's struck. Christ said, they mourned over my death. I was the good shepherd, John chapter 10, who was struck and killed on the cross. Didn't you know that Zechariah was preparing you for me? Or maybe he went to the final words of the Hebrew Bible, the final words of the Old Testament, Malachi 4 where it says, before the great and awesome day of the Lord, someone like Elijah is coming. It's John the Baptist. And when he comes, after him will be the son of righteousness will appear with healing in his wings. Didn't you know that after John the Baptist, I am the son, the son of righteousness who brings healing, spiritual healing to people? Didn't you realize that? So it's interesting, it's inviting. How many passages did Christ use? How many did he look to? Did he use more passages? Did he use fewer to show them that everything that they read in the Hebrew Bible pointed to him. That Genesis to Malachi points to him. And that scripture only makes sense when you read it in light of the Lord Jesus Christ. That the Hebrew Bible wasn't primarily about ethics or morality. It was primarily about Christology, about Christ, about the person of Jesus Christ. To prepare you for him, to see him, to believe in him in his death and his resurrection. What passages did he, we don't know. It would have been great to just be able to listen and hear. What did Christ teach them? It would have saved me about four years of seminary too, by the way. Um, as we look at this text, what, what does this text mean for us this morning? What are, what are some points that we take from this that we can apply and live out? And I would suggest there's three. The first one is this. The first one is this. If, if, and this is specifically if you're here this morning, and you're kind of skeptical of Christianity, you're not really sure, maybe you have some doubts, and uncertain. The first point is this. If you want to know your Creator, if you want to know the triune God, you find Him in Scripture because it points you to Him. From Genesis to Revelation, if you want to find God, you have to be in the Word of God. And that is important to make note of because, and specifically in Western culture, it says if you want to find a deity, the deity, a deity, many deities, whatever deity, the options in our culture are, one, look inward, which is a really bad idea, by the way. Look inward and, and find that. Or number two, maybe, maybe go to the mountains or go to the beach and enjoy a sunset or a, a sunrise and, and feel that transcendent deity. Find it in nature. Or our culture says, you know what, you're, a, you're an idiot for trying to find God. We are alone in the universe. We're here by accident. You're all alone, so give up looking for a deity. Don't look inward. Don't look outward. Just live for stuff and create your own meaning in life. That's your other option in our culture. That there isn't a God. You're on your own. Give up. Live for yourself. Live for money. Live for pleasure. Create your own meta narrative. Luke 24 puts a stop sign to that journey to find your own meaning. It says, no, there actually is. Luke 24 says there is a resurrected God. He's found in Scripture. And as you read pages like Genesis or Isaiah or Luke's Gospel, or as you study Zechariah, Gary's going to be teaching on that next, next Sunday morning at 9.30, if you study Zechariah, it doesn't point you to ethics or morality first and foremost. It points you to the Lord Jesus Christ, that He is there. He is alive. He's, on, he's found in Scripture. And the Holy Spirit ministers to you, speaks to you, serves you as you are in God's Word. It is what we say often a means of grace, a means by which you receive God's grace being in the Word of God. So if you're not a Christian, you're thinking, I don't don't know, maybe there isn't a deity, maybe there isn't a God, maybe there's many gods, maybe it's all leading in the same direction. Look into Scripture. 
The second point this morning is, okay, say you're a Christian. You're a good Presbyterian. You're a good Christian. When you read Scripture, here's the second point this morning. The main theme of Scripture is not about how to make your life better. The main theme of Scripture is not how to live better. Uh, The main theme of Scripture is not how to be better because the main theme of Scripture is not about you at all or about me. The theme is about the Lord Jesus Christ, the coming of the Son of God, God in the flesh, to live amongst His people, John chapter 1, to dwell amongst us, and then offer His perfect life as a perfect sacrifice on the cross to die for our sins, and then to rise again to show, to demonstrate that death has been defeated. Death is not anything we should fear as Christians. Then he ascends back to the presence of the Lord, to to the Father. The Bible, if you're a Christian, the Bible points to him, whether you're reading Genesis or Job or Psalms, Isaiah, Hosea, whatever it might be, from Matthew to, to Revelation in the New Testament as well. It points to him. It doesn't point to ethics primarily or morality primarily or sin avoidance primarily. None of those things. It doesn't point to any self-help Primarily, it points to the Lord Jesus Christ, His person and His work. And so as you read Scripture, it should open your eyes, open your heart to see Christ on the pages of Scripture, whether you're reading Genesis, Leviticus, Zechariah, the Psalms, Luke's Gospel. It leads you to understand Him more deeply and to know Him and His character at a deeper level than you did last year or two years ago or last month. So we look back at our story from Luke 24. There's one more thing I want you to see here. Final point this morning from Luke chapter 24. It says they finished their walk, their life-changing walk, and they had a meal with Christ, and they came to recognize him. Oh, look at this. We found him, right? He found them, maybe. It says after they recognized him at this meal, they, Christ left their presence, and they were alone. Then you keep reading verse 32. It says as they reflected on their walk with Christ, that life-changing walk, And as Christ talked to them about Genesis to to Malachi, it says, quote in verse 32, their hearts burned within them. They remembered how their hearts burned within them. As God's word was opened to them by Christ, the word of God, their hearts began to burn. They had a desire to hear the word of God, a desire to know the the word of God. And that's, that's the final point to think about this morning. As you read and study God's word, and make it a priority in your life, not something that's kind of low on the list of priorities. But as you make it a priority and read Scripture looking for Christ, you will grow in a desire to know and to hear and to understand more of who God is and what He has done in redemptive history, or what Francis Schaeffer used to say, in time and space and in history, what He's done for you. Scripture will not give you a burning desire to advance your career. Scripture will not give you a burning desire to just increase my bank account. Scripture will not give you this burning desire to to make more of myself and live for myself. It doesn't do that. The Holy Spirit doesn't work to create idols in your life as you read Scripture. The Holy Spirit works through Scripture to demolish those idols. The Holy Spirit works through Scripture to demolish those things that you might value above God, including yourself so that you don't worship yourself or your career or anything like that. The Holy Spirit works to give you a desire to know the triune God as you read Scripture, study it, pray on it, through the pages of the written Word. A desire to know more. As we look at our story here, Luke 24, it ends ends with a meal. It says they had a meal with Christ before He left their presence. And this meal here, if, if we had more time, we would spend time on this, but I would encourage you to read this on your own later. This meal here in Luke 24 recalls or brings to mind two previous meals in Luke's gospel. What we call the feeding of the 5,000 in Luke chapter 9, and then the the Passover meal that became the Last Supper in Luke chapter 22. This meal is cast in those same terms, so I would commend you to read this afternoon how those meals are similar. But what I want you to see here as we finish is just as in the feeding of the 5,000 and in the Last Supper and here, there is a progression, a spiritual progression through each of those three meals that is worth noting as we finish this morning. At the feeding of the 5,000 in Luke chapter 9, all the people are fed, and the response of that meal was, it says in Luke chapter 9, they were satisfied. In Christ's presence, 
with, with God's people. They were satisfied. In the Last Supper, the second meal, the response of that meal, God's people gathered there in that room. The response in Christ's presence was to remember Christ, right? Luke chapter 22. Here, the progression in this last meal that Christ has here in Luke chapter 24, the progression is not one of satisfaction. It's not one of remembrance. The meal concludes with revelation. They, the Lord Jesus Christ is revealed to them. And so the feeding of the 5,000, they were satisfied. In the Last Supper, they remember him. Here, divine revelation occurs. They know what has happened. There's a progression here in these meals that are very similar. And Christ is revealed to them not as a guest in their house, but as the host of the meal who welcomes them to a meal. And our service this morning ends the same way as this story in Luke 24 ends. It ends with a meal in the presence of, of the risen Christ. A meal that is revelatory. The sacrament here reveals God's grace to you. It reveals in a tangible way signs and seals of God's grace. Signs and seals of His mercy to you, a sinner, demonstrated through the work of Christ. And so this morning as we come to the Lord's table, this is to strengthen your faith because the Lord Jesus Christ is no longer in the tomb. The tomb has been empty for a couple thousand years. He's alive. He's on the throne. He's, he's ruling and reigning. Scripture is clear on that. And all his promises for you in life and in death are signified uh, in the bread and in the juice because of his finished work at the cross. And so this morning, as we come to the Lord's table, reflect on those gospel promises that are signified in the sacrament this morning. Let's pray.